Hello and welcome. I am Scarberlock and this is City of Heroes on the Rebirth server. We are with Quintessence Lass, our level 48 brute. Who has 32 million experience earned, 2 million to go to get to level 49 in our last superpower. 53 million influence and we're on a story arc for Unai Kamen who says, I'm certain that Requiem of Werewolf World is behind these dimensional ruptures. Why, when he touched your mind, he all but admitted it. If you can defeat him, we may be able to bring a stop to this chaos. We just need some way to force him to show himself. I want you to go see if Peter Stemmitz has an idea. Um, before we do that, I do want to point out, I now have a couple of my alts in my super group. I've added Tiger Shrike and Psyop. I have not added my Guardian, and the reason I haven't added him is because he is doing a um, an Iron Man run and will die. At some point, when we're defeated, that's the end of the character. So I don't have to then take him out of the group or whatever. So um, one of the things that's a little frustrating is I don't seem to be able to promote these characters. So they're just junior members right now. But I think that should give them enough that they can enter the base and possibly mess around with salvage and stuff. Mostly I want to be able to give salvage from Tiger Shrike. Um, and maybe take some for Psyop at some point when I get back around to playing her. Um... So anyway, uh, thank, big thanks to Kiovar who told me about the slash alt invite command, just slash alt invite in the name of the character. And if there is a space in the character's name, then you need to um, do slash alt invite comma character name. And believe it or not, that actually works. Um, so... I'm not sure why I'm going the long way when I could have just used your Boros to sort of zoom over there, but we're mostly all the way to the boat now, so we may as well just take the boat and go to Talos Island. It doesn't save us much at this point. So we're going to Founders Falls, we're going to talk to Peter Stemmitz, and Peter Stemmitz will, I guess, give us some information on how to beat Requiem. Getting toward the end of this story arc, the next time you see this character, she will be level 49. We will have gotten our last power, and we will be um, en route to our 50th and final level. And I'm going the wrong way as usual. Here we go. Haven't actually come back from the ferry in a long time. That's the arena. Where the heck am I? Okay, let's zoom in. The train station is right there we go. Okay. Yeah, I don't usually manually come back from the ferry, so... And then I kind of went the wrong way coming up the hill, and that completely confused me. Also, on Homecoming, there's no arena. And so I got a little bit disoriented by seeing that arena there like what but we're good now we've got the we're at the railroad and we're going to head to founders falls so this character is doing really well um we're on plus three and i i see no reason to lower it to fight requiem at least the first time now we may well lose to him and if we do, then I will set it on plus zero, finish him off. Unlike my um, Iron Man mode, where if I had it on plus three, I wouldn't be able to lower it. And if we died to Requiem, it wouldn't matter, because we'd have to stop playing the character. This character can res. So one of the reasons I wanted to actually add other characters to the supergroup is that I mean, eventually, when I stop playing this character, she's not going to be earning prestige, and we've got to—we're going to still have to want to earn prestige to build up the base. So um, I want to be able to maybe Tiger Strike can do a little bit, and then Psyop can earn a whole bunch of prestige once I start playing her. So Yo Quintessence Lass, how's my favorite hero? You need to find—you need a way to force Requiem to manifest. Well, I have an idea. Requiem is not exactly what you call a being of pure darkness. That Nictus that fused with his soul. Oh, well, we have darkness too. Dark energy, right? That Nictus that fused with his soul is purely dark, but Requiem was originally human. There's a good chance there's a part of him that still craves light. I've seen it before. No matter how evil, it's hard for any human to completely turn his back. Uh, talk to Azuria about that. Okay, so now we're going to go to Azuria. Um, 
Yeah, this is another case of because the character has dark powers. My characters, dark melee, and dark and, and energy orb. Dark melee as her primary. It would be nice if they had an if-then statement in there where I saw a slightly different dialogue. Why is somebody shooting me? Like, seriously, I am eight levels higher than whoever you are, unless it's an ambush. Is this an ambush? I'm eight levels higher than anybody else in this zone. Oh, it is an ambush. Okay. Well, all right, I buy that. These are Praetorians. Interesting. So the question is, why are the Praetorians coming after me? Is, this, is it the Praetorian Requiem that's doing all this? It might be. I don't remember. If it is, then this is not an old story arc. It's a newer one. Obviously, everything's old in City of Heroes because the game uh, stopped existing like eight years ago, nine years ago. And this content would have been built like 12 years ago. But compared to the original stuff that was here at launch, this arc would be much newer if there were Praetorians involved. So guys, I'm recording this on the day after I have submitted all final grades for my students, so I'm super happy. It's 3 in the afternoon, and ordinarily I'd be in some sort of a meeting or be getting ready for a meeting, and instead today is like the online version of the graduation, which is happening in person tomorrow, and I'm, I'm not. I don't see any point to like logging into a Zoom to watch boring speeches about graduation. You can't really see the students. And my whole purpose for going to graduation used to be back in the days when we could touch people and be near them. I would go in and shake their hands and, you know, sometimes the students would give me a hug and you congratulate them. That was why I used to like to go, but I can't actually do that now. So I don't really see the point to graduate. Just sitting on a, on a hard chair or in, in this case, watching on a Zoom while a bunch of people are also watching on a Zoom while a bunch of people make boring speeches. Um, yeah doesn't appeal to me okay a pure flame yes it's a clever plan i cannot myself construct a pure flame for that you'll need a champion of the people um someone whose inner light is fueled by the love of thousands take this candle to maria jenkins who we've worked with before so this is one of these travel all around the the map scenarios which I kind of enjoy when they do this. Um, there's no combat, of course. You don't get a lot of experience. But I like when all of the NPCs who've been helping you all along get involved at the end. Like um, the one, what is it, the Unity Plague, where you go to every single trainer, like Ms. Liberty and um, Citadel and those guys, and they, and Castle, and they help you distribute the cure to each section that they patrol. And I, I really like that. I think that that's, it makes it feel like those awesome heroes are participating and they're not just saying, here, you go do it, you know, it gets them involved. It gets the whole, it gets you involved in the, uh, the heroing of the individual sections, right? So, um, Citadel here is the hero of... Uh, or Luminary, whichever one of these. These are like the heroes of Talos Island, right? They're the ones who are um, protecting Talos Island on a regular basis, whereas the player character heroes are only here for a little while, and then as their security level goes up, they move somewhere else. And um, it is those two who are holding down the fort 24-7. And so I like it when you get to involve one of them in the in the mechanism for saving Talus Island, and, and same with all the other sections. Now, the reason I'm coming in here is we have a bunch of magic. Um, oh, you know what? I took those enhancements off when I did my set, and I guess I never got rid of them. <laughs> I need to bring them to the base. Another reason why I want to give Psyop access to the base so that I don't have to keep mailing stuff to her. She can just come in and get uh, IOs whenever she's ready. I'd still, I'll still have to mail influence to her, but I don't have to mail enhancements. It's a pain in the neck because you can only attach one at a time. Same with salvage. Like, Tiger Strike has, like, 20 orange salvage, and I've just never emailed it to myself because it would require 20 emails, and it's just such a pain that I don't want to do it. <laughs> right? It's just so tedious. 
and I don't like tedium is, I'm sure anyone who's watched any significant amount of this playthrough would know. As we go, I'm, uh, I talked about some things in D&D with other people and talked about like what advice I have and so forth. And um, both stories have evolved, so I want to continue those stories. But first, let's get into a mission where we'll maybe have some time to actually talk hard to do while we're reading all these texts. Okay, so is there believes I can summon pure flame? Well, I don't know. Well, I'll be. She did it. Okay, so call Unai, who says... So that's the pure flame, huh? Pretty beautiful. If I understand this pure flame correctly, you carry it to Requiem's dimension and you make your presence known. Eventually, Requiem will be drawn to the flame. Once, you know, he's been a living darkness for a long time, he won't be able to resist it. Once he shows himself, you've got to defeat Requiem and all his other minions. Maybe that'll put a stop to the dimensional ruptures. The trouble is the technicians detected instability, so you can only stay there for 90 minutes, and this looks like defeat Requiem. Guys, we're going in. We are going in at plus three. But I do want to fill in my inspirations. One more accuracy. Um... I think we're actually going to need some defense here. And um, and let's check email. I think we have we still have some more of these. Did we not have any more resistance? I thought we did. We have team accuracy damage. Health endurance. There we go. Def res. We do have two left. Let's finish them out. These things, I think, last a little longer, too, if I'm not mistaken. They last five minutes instead of one. So that should make us really tough for a while, right? 18% extra defense, 11% resistance. We could stack two of them, and it'll last five minutes, and then stack these other two. I don't know how long this one lasts. This one also lasts five minutes, right? So we can stack these two. If five minutes go by, we can stack these two. This one, I think, also lasts five minutes. So we can hit this, and then just one of each. And then as these individual ones fade, you know, we're not going to have the extra damage, but by then our fury should be so built up that it won't matter. So I think we'll, I think we'll be okay. We also have a panic power right here. That will only happen when we've completely drained our entire tray. So I'm going to try to do the whole tray and um, and the panic power and if he kills us after that then we're dead, right? And then I'll have to lower the difficulty. But um, but let's try him at plus three and see if we can kick his butt. Defeat Requiem. And this is the end of this story arc, guys. We'll probably do another mission after this, unless it's really, really long. But we should be able to find him very quickly because they're pretty much always on this map in the back here, um, near this uh, this leaning building, right? So if you if you take a look, you see where this building is right here. Usually the bad guy is down there somewhere, and there he is. So he's a plus three elite boss. He's not plus four. So we're going to start out cleaning this out because um, it'll build up a little bit of fury, but also. We want to make sure that these guys don't get involved in case we get knocked around the battlefield or he comes running over here. Requiem is probably going to be pretty resistant to our, our attacks. Um, we're going to want to lean on our first three on this tray, the ones that do smashing damage, because he's probably super resistant to negative and Therefore, Midnight Grass been going to be doing like 300 to him or 200 or whatever to him. So Requiem's over there. I think we can pull these guys out. Not wait. I'm not really sure actually. So this one's probably chained to him. Let's see if uh, we can go across here. Yeah, I want to make sure we take these guys out too. We're going to leave Soul Drain because I want to use it on Requiem. Well, actually, we can go ahead and use it because we have to 
good to try to grab those other three guys too. And we have to realize we might bring Requiem at that point, but we'll try not to. You can see how these Warwolves otherwise are of absolutely no threat to us. So if I can pull the guy that's furthest away, they will come, but hopefully he will not. Yep, that's what we want. So we got three of them mad at me, but we didn't get him and his buddy. Perfect! Well guys, I think this mission is probably going to be too short to talk about role-playing game stuff, so we will do that afterwards. Because we've only been in this uh, episode for a little while. Right, what is it? Um, it's only been 15 minutes, so we do have some more time after we defeat Requiem. My guess is we'll, we'll about be about five minutes from now. Depending on how fast he regenerates and how much defense he has against me. Alright, here we go, guys. I'm going to start with those, and we'll see how it does, how we do. Okay, yeah, he's got about 50% defense against negative. Oh man, I don't know if I can overcome his, uh, his regeneration. He's got a lot of regeneration. I might not be able to overcome it. We'll see. I'm going to leave that guy here so that I can suck his endurance up a couple times. He shouldn't be able to harm me. Alright, we're doing a number on Requiem now. Let's do a little bit more um, damage if we can. Soul Drain. Get some endurance. Alright, we're doing okay. Go ahead and pull up more accuracy. I feel like we will have enough time here. We can do a little more damage and a little more resistance. I think we should be alright. Our resistance is insane now, so he shouldn't be able to hurt me. Guys, we are doing Requiem at plus freaking three. Look at this. We got him at plus three. We defeated Requiem. He didn't even do anything to me. Now, of course, Inspirations played a big role in that, but... He is plus three. We got 43 reward merits. And we completed the story arc, guys. Very cool. All right, let's head out. We'll get another mission. And in that mission, I'll talk about the D&D garbage. All right. Um, so there we go. We're now six beads into level 48. Quintessence last. Thank goodness you are back. You got uh, out just in time. No, I didn't. There were like 80 minutes left. Werewolf war World just disappeared completely. All the ruptures leading to it shut down, and Portal Techs can't find it anywhere. I guess Re Requiem, Requiem's lust for destruction finally caught up with him, or bear with me a moment. It could be that all these ruptures were just due to the disintegration of Werewolf World. That, that's a tongue twister, Werewolf World. Um, as it began to disappear, disrupted the fabric of the multiverse. Um, perhaps someone else is pulling the strings. Yeah, the real Requiem? My guess would be, right? Because I'm pretty sure at one point the real Requiem said that he was just manipulating us in one of our other characters' run-throughs. But I don't know if we've been to that, been in that um, story arc yet here. Let's see what other contacts we have. Let's, um, we'll stop here because we might end up doing portal tech stuff and see what do we have. So Crimson actually is ready to give us story arcs. I think he's level 48. So let's go give him a talk. He won't give it to us right away, but we'll do the first mission. Uh, because we do have we have quite some time. We're only 19 minutes in. So let me pause it here, and I'll bring you back when we are with Crimson. All right, folks, we're back, and Crimson says... Indigo is keeping tabs on you. She says you're good. Here's your chance to convince me. 
You've worked with me before. You know the ground rules, but I'm going to take a minute to repeat them just in case. You're not working for me, you're working with me. This is an important distinction because it bases our working relationship on trust and mutual benefit. Well, I don't know that I trust Crimson, but all that said, we need to take care of the Malta. Okay, so Malta are going to be a pain in the neck. But we do have endurance boosting powers, so that actually should stand us in good stead. Let's put it that way. Um, so defeat all Malta in the lab. This should be an indoor mission. It should be something that will allow me to talk about some other stuff. Rather than concentrating on, you know, fighting an elite boss. Guys, I have to tell you, I don't know how many of my other characters could have just taken Requiem like that at plus three. Even with Inspirations. She just does such a good job of putting out amazing amounts of damage. She, she might do more damage now per minute than even... Silver Phoenix, and Silver Phoenix puts out a lot of damage. Now, maybe not Silver Phoenix at level 50 with her incarnate powers, but let Silver Phoenix before incarnates at level 48, yes, I think she at least matches Silver Phoenix. Okay, so we're just defeating all, and um, they have goals, they have a key. We're just going to defeat everybody. As we go, in past episodes, I've mentioned two issues in Dungeons and Dragons that stemmed from spouses. One was an issue in which a DM was playing favorites with his wife. Um, I think I've mentioned this. So what was happening is uh, somebody posted and he admitted, you know, this is really mostly venting, but he posted to D&D Beyond complaining that um, he was playing in a game with, uh, you know, some friends of his and there was a monk character who whose background stuff keeps being roleplayed about, and all the other characters' backgrounds are ignored. And, oh, the, the DM had given her... I think I mentioned this. So she had a low, I guess, charisma, and she was sort of annoyed at having a low charisma, and consequently the DM said, okay, well, something from her background happened. He said, okay, you, you can just get plus two to your charisma. And nobody else get any benefits, just, this, just the monk. And so when the one player objected... The DM said, no, nope, you know, this is part of her storyline. Um, and so he complained, and it was the wife that this husband DM did this with. And of course, that's, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't play favorites like that with a relative or a friend. I've tried to be very careful with my best friend, and one of the things that has always concerned me is that I feel like sometimes he's asking for special treatment, and I feel like sometimes he's asking for it because he's my best friend, and I don't know if he's even consciously doing it, but I, I do think that he definitely asks for things that he would not ask another DM for. And um, I think he does that because he knows that he's my best friend and he figures that I'll, you know, maybe do it for him because we're friends. I don't think he's consciously trying to exploit the friendship, but I think unconsciously he kind of is. And I've had to really be careful to avoid letting him get any advantages over the other characters because the other players aren't asking for anything and he is and he feels like what he's asking for is small it's just this little thing it's just this little magic item it's just a little this it's just a little that but my concern is always yes but is it going to upstage the other characters is it something the other characters aren't allowed to do and is it going to start looking like I'm letting my best friend do whatever he wants because he's my best friend that's no better than doing it as a spouse so I, you know, as this went on, and this guy was talking about, it wasn't just this case. A lot of times in this campaign, this GM has let the wife do stuff. She's, he said she's never failed a saving throw. She's never missed a skill check. <clears throat> she's never, um, she's never, she doesn't miss, like, so I said, okay, from where I sit, this is, this is, it's time to bail. Right. Obviously, this GM is playing favorites. Either, like he he described, for instance, the DC that is the difficulty class of a skill. You have to beat it. You have to roll higher than it in D and D in order to succeed. After adding all your bonuses and stuff, you roll a twenty-sided die and see if you beat it. He said at one point, the wife rolled a seven with all of her bonuses. Now, typically in D and D, it is possible to have a DC five, 
Um, but most GMs don't put things that are DC5 because nearly anyone is going to beat that because by the time you're like even at first level if you have a couple bonuses it's plus two or three you can't fail um and a one is not an automatic fail like it would be in some other games in D&D so most DMs don't bother with the DC of five ten is considered easy fifteen is moderate twenty is hard twenty five is very hard and thirty is nearly impossible because most characters aren't going to have enough bonuses to add ten right, to a 19 or something to get a 29. So, um, so he said she rolled a 7, and the, the DM was, her husband was just like, ah, oh, yeah, well, it was a really low DC, so you made it. Well, that's probably bunk, right, because most DMs would not set a DC of 5 or 6, and that's the only way she could have beaten it, right? So, after reading this and all the other favoritism that this GM has apparently given to his wife, I said to him, "Go, get out, run for the hills. This, you're, you're, you're never gonna. He's never gonna stop. It's his wife. Either she's. He said she's very competitive. The wife, and she always wants to be the best at everything. And apparently, the GM has decided to enable this, to allow it, to enable it, to say it's okay, and to let her do it. You got to get out of this campaign. Well." He then, like, got into an argument with me saying, these are my best friends. We we trade off GMing, like, they play every week, but each GM, he and the other guy, DM on alternate weeks. So this week is his turn, next week is the other guy's turn. We're all friends, there are seven of us, we've been best friends for years, we've played in multiple campaigns together, and um, no, I don't want to leave this group. I also told him he was describing these intricate the intricate background of the wife, which has been the focus of this campaign, which is what he's complaining about, his own intricate background, the uh, intricate, intricate background of one of the other characters. And I said, well, you guys know how I feel about backgrounds. Part of this is the problem. The problem is that you're, you've got these super intricate backgrounds that are like appropriate for a character in a novel rather than being appropriate for a role-playing game. And what you really just need is something to start with, a reason why your character is with the party and going on adventures and is going to stay with the party, right? That's all you need is a reason why your character would go on quests. And if you can do that, then you can put any put that character into any D&D game. And I said, when, when you make, as I've told you here, when you make these complicated backgrounds, what ends up happening is the other characters, the other players have to sit there and watch while your background is being explored. That's just the nature of the beast. And, oh, this guy saw me. Wow. Um, so I said, you you know, you know, probably should try to avoid that. And he said, well, no, we, we like these backgrounds. They like having campaigns that are focused around the backgrounds of their player characters rather than being about some external story. So, okay, well, if you like these stories and you want this thing with the backgrounds... I mean, yeah, the GM shouldn't play favorites, but to some degree you're asking for it because you've agreed that there are going to be these long, involved, complicated backgrounds with, you know, that you have to run a whole campaign or a whole series of adventures to deal with, and you're going to have to understand that sometimes it's not going to be about your background because you can only do one at a time, right? And so, um, so I said, okay, this is somebody <coughs> who doesn't want help, and he admitted... <clears throat> he just came to vent. But what he's really saying is, I like the way we play as long as it's about me, right? Or it's not too much about somebody else. So, um, whatever help I proposed for this issue isn't, isn't for him. But it could be for other people if you're listening and if you have a situation in which a GM is giving favoritism to their best friend or their sister or their brother or their wife or their husband or what have you. Um, I mean, you can try talking to the GM. But the reality of the situation is that they are probably not going to change. Right? Because if they, because if they recognized that what they're doing is wrong, they wouldn't be doing it in the first place. Right? So, I mean, maybe they're doing it unconsciously, but it's hard to imagine that. This much favoritism was unconscious <clears throat> so that's the first one the second one involving spouses this is fun 
<laughs> this is the story of the guy who joined D&D &D because his wife wanted to join D&D &D, and then he was being very aggressive and the GM was actually almost afraid of him. And I feel like this uh, Circuit Red Alpha is giving us at least as hard of a fight as Requiem was. And is doing more damage. Now, of course, I'm not using as many inspirations against him, but still. It's pretty amazing how good of a fight he's given us. So, um... <clears throat> so the story there is... You know, I said, look, you know, one of the things he said was that the husband and wife are, like, always arguing and fighting with each other, and, like, it actually makes some of their friends uncomfortable. And I'm like, why, why are you, if you knew this about these people, why did you invite them to your D&D group? Bad idea. So I said, you probably should find a way to get them out. I mean, it seems like you, you just don't want either one of them here, because if they're going to be that way... I mean, maybe the wife would be okay without the husband, or the husband would be okay without the wife, but they're clearly, when they're together, not a group, a pair of people that you want at your table. And he said they were ruining his game. So I said, well, you might want to, you know, find a way to get rid of them. I mean, just say, look, we're not, this isn't working out. Um, again, very hard to do without jeopardizing your actual friendship outside of D&D. &D. But then he said, <clears throat> the latest update on that one is they just got a call from them that the wife has di been diagnosed positive for coronavirus. So now they played in person and he said one of the other players wasn't vaccinated so now that person is has got a quarantine and you know vaccination isn't 100% proof anyway so everybody's probably got a quarantine now. And he said, if I find out that she knew that she, w that she was having symptoms, I'm going to be really mad. Like, well, it, it wouldn't surprise me if she was, because these people sound selfish. So, I mean, the story on that is, guys, don't play with selfish people. I know it's very hard to know before D&D &D starts if they're going to be selfish in the game of D&D. &D. But it sounds very clear to me in both of these cases that the person who is making the complaint on the forum knew ahead of time that this was going to be an issue and they said i'm gonna play D, D this way anyway well if you make that decision i don't have any suggestion for you because i can't help you right that's like somebody saying look i know that my family is predisposed genetically to alcoholism and i shouldn't drink but i'm going to be hard drinker anyway well i can't help you if that's the way you're going to be right because you know i already told you how it is if you have a predisposition toward alcoholism, you should probably try to avoid drinking a lot of alcohol. Um, if you're going to say, screw that, I'm going to drink anyway, then you don't want my help, right? If you're going to say, I know that this couple causes trouble every time they're out. They fight with each other, argue with each other all the time. They're a pain in the ass to be around. But I'm going to play D&D with them anyway. Then you kind of deserve what you get. It's one thing to invite somebody that seems like a nice person, they get into your D&D group, and surprisingly, they're not so nice. That happens, and it can be very difficult and painful. But when you are going to invite people, um, and I'll answer this guy off screen and tell him no. Uh, when you're going to invite people, where are we going? I'll meet with Indigo. Well, that was a mistake. Um, when you're going to invite people to... Um, your group that you already know fight with each other outside of D&D. &D. Why would you be surprised that they're fighting with each other inside D&D? &D? Right? When you're going to invite people or when you're going to game with a group of people that you know from experience the DM plays favorites with his wife. Why are you coming on to complain to me that he's playing favorites with his wife? You should have known that before it started and if you didn't want to play with that with somebody doing that you should have said, I don't want to play. So let me just... Um, so, I don't know. I mean, to some degree, we do these things to ourselves, folks. Sometimes we can be blindsided by obnoxious people who seem nice, and then they turn out to be obnoxious, and that happens. Um... 
you know, what my best friend is doing where he was playing, you know, with four pay DMs who were screening applicants. And even after screening applicants, there were some people who were tr problematic and one whole campaign that was problematic for him. Um, that is understandable because you don't know the people before you start and you can't know until you're several weeks into it whether it's going to work. And of course, like when we had the, the friend of ours who was throwing papers around the room saying, fine, see if I, see if he, let him die, see if I care, or cheating on his endurance. We didn't know he was going to do that. We were friends with him outside of Champions. <clears throat> he was a really nice guy outside of Champions. He continued to be a really nice guy even after we knew he was doing this crap in Champions, right? So we were kind of blindsided that he was actually cheating. Like, nobody... I mean, we knew he was sort of flouting the limits that we had on active points. That was sort of an arbitrary house rule, so nobody thought anything of it. But when it came time to, like, him actually cheating on his character sheet, nobody expected him to do that, right? And he was such a nice guy, it, would, it was hard to sort of break away. But if you've got somebody who you know is, like, you see cheating all the time... You shouldn't be surprised when you invite them into your D&D group and they're cheating. If you've got a couple you see constantly arguing with each other all the time, you shouldn't be surprised when they come into your D&D group and they're always arguing with each other. And if you've got a DM who always gives his wife right all the time outside of D&D, you shouldn't be surprised if he's giving his wife extra stuff inside D&D when you sit down to play with them. So, um, and really I think folks shouldn't post to the D, D beyond forum or anywhere else i mean, like i know sometimes you want to rant but the the especially the one guy who posted in the dm forum which is for dm advice the instinct of the rest of us who have been playing for years is to try and help and if you're literally just posting to vent and you don't want to listen to any advice and all the advice we give you you're going to say i can't do that don't post and certainly don't get annoyed as the one guy seemed to be that we're giving him advice that he doesn't want to follow, right? Then don't post. Um, and that's why in the one thread I said, okay, you seem to be, you know, you, okay, you posted here to vent. You seem to actually be okay with this. Otherwise, nothing to see here. Move along. And then I unsubscribe from the thread. Um, to me, I don't make a post if it's just a rant, right? I post if I want feedback. I mean, even here, if if I rant about something and somebody posts, a, uh, like, here's a solution, I'm not going to say I don't want the solution. Sometimes I might say the solution won't work for me, right? But I'm not going to complain that people are suggesting options or alternatives. I know you're trying to be helpful, and hey, I, if, if it turns out that I can use the option, great. All right, so Indigo says, good to have, see you, contestants last. Crimson alerted me, what's going on? Malta group operatives ship several shipments of equipment to that lab before you arrived i was able to pull some strings and had the police stop all the trucks leaving the city so at the very least our friends didn't get away with any blank cray revenants however there's a lot still missing including genetic profiles for hundreds of heroes stored para personality templates and so forth the idea of our friends being able to mass produce superhumans is scary yes the malta are pretty bad you gotta meet with an informant on the train now how are we doing on time Gosh, we're at 38. All right, so guys, I'm going to do this off screen since I don't think this is a story arc. And I will bring you back at level 49 when we are on our next story arc. Until next time, I am Scrapperlock, and this has been City of Heroes on the Rebirth server.